Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Alex Voto with the Gitcoin team, and I'm excited to share uh, the second installment of uh, Stellar's workshop series for the New York Blockchain Week Hackathon. Uh, we're joined by a couple folks from the team, including uh, Colton and Tyler, um, who are going to go a little bit more into depth and show you how to actually dig in and, and uh, start building with Stellar. So um, if you all want to just give a quick introduction to the kind of topics that we're going to share today, and uh, jump into it. The floor is all yours. All right, super. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll get into a little bit in my slides. My name is Tyler Vanderhoeven. Uh, I'm the ecosystem evangelist at the Stellar Development Foundation. Um, today, we're going to be getting into a little bit more of the technical side of Stellar, how to get up and running building applications on top of Stellar. And uh, if it's all right, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Go for Which it. Are you able I, to? Oh, here. I seem yeah. to be disabled. So we. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see how it is. There you um, go. You should be good. Perfect. All right, I'm going to try and share this whole desktop screen. Nice. All right. So, welcome everyone to my TED Talk. Wait. No, this is a hack stellar talk. Where am uh, I? We're gonna, yeah, exactly. Uh, we're going to be going over um, building on top of Stellar. Uh, I am a ecosystem evangelist uh, at the SDF, uh, as I mentioned. Um, I, in a past life, I was a full stack developer um, for a company doing business analytics. So I have a lot of experience with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Kind of glad I'm not doing a whole lot of that anymore. Um, but I do really enjoy talking about um, Stellar and some of the technical aspects of building applications on top of Stellar. I've been building Stellar applications for about three years. Um, we have uh, a funding mechanism for the community at, at the SDF. Um, when I was first getting started, it was called the Stellar Build Challenge. It's been rebranded as the Stellar Community Fund. Uh, just a phenomenal opportunity to kickstart development uh, within uh, your Stellar applications or applications that you're building that you want to receive funding for. That's how I got my start. I uh, built several applications and have won a couple of times. In that, I actually help run that fund now. So it's come full circle. Um, so we're going to go over some of what I've learned building Stellar applications, particularly in the JavaScript arena. However, we have a lot of different SDKs for different languages, and the syntax will be the same as it all comes from the same API. So first off, let's just get a little bit of background um, on what Stellar is. Uh, coming directly from our, our website, Stellar is an open network for storing and moving money. I think it's important um, to understand in my world, money doesn't just mean fiat currency. This can be anything that's valuable, anything that you're wanting to, to move uh, over the internet. So anything that you have that can be tokenized and transferred, that's what I consider money to be. And Stellar is amazing at, at storing and moving that value uh, around through different parties. Stellar is specifically designed for this. It's not, uh, it's not Ethereum. It's different in that sense where you can't do anything on Stellar. Uh, it's very specific and uh, intentional for storing and moving money. <clears throat> so, well, what does that mean really uh, when we talk about money? I, I would boil it down to, to two things when we're talking about Stellar, and that would be interoperable payments. So uh, money is only valuable in its ability to be transferred. Um, if I have something that I think is valuable, my rock collection, but you don't think that's valuable or you have no access to get my rock collection, uh, how valuable is it really? And so this idea of interoperability becomes very, very important. And I would also argue that it's very under, uh, underutilized. We don't really necessarily think about this. We're so ingrained in our idea about money being very local. Um, money's only valuable as far as my feet can take it, which is why I don't want to hold Canadian dollars or euros. I want to hold USD because that's what my grocery store is going to accept. But when you start to move your money onto the internet, those borders um, become much more fuzzy because now I can, I can interact and trade with anyone in the world. And those folks are going to want different currencies. They're not, they may not want USD or 
um, the idea that something is valuable only as far as my feet can take it is no longer true. It doesn't hold true anymore. And so the whole concept of um, moving your money um, really changes in its shape when you add the concept of interoperability or the internet to the equation. Um, and Stella recognizes this and bakes it into the very core where once we have payments that can, that can move, once you have a value storage and movement, uh, it becomes a bit arbitrary what those tokens are. So long as somebody finds them valuable in the world, you can trade with that person so long as they're on the network. So it becomes much more important that there is a, a network for money and a network for value transfer and less important what those uh, items are. Um, and that's where the payments come in. It's not just payments for money as we might think of fiat currencies, but it's payments of anything that ha uh, might be valuable. And so so would be those interoperable payments. And that becomes really important. So I would say really think about this, really challenge when you're thinking about applications that you might build or finan financial infrastructure that you might implement into your applications, really challenge um, your assumptions of what you think money is, particularly when uh, just, just really consider the assumptions that you're making when it comes to money, because my guess is a lot of times we're assuming things that aren't true anymore once money is on the internet, once money can move much more fluidly. It's that uh, the change that might have come between uh, letters traveling on horseback to now we have email. <clears throat> when it comes to Stellar, there are some key concepts um, that again are very important. Stellar is, is, is quite simple. We don't have native smart contracts or Turing complete um, programming. We have keys which correlate to wallets which in turn make payments or submit transactions to the network. And it really all does boil down to keys. No matter what entity you are, whether you're a service provider, a user, an application, or just some arbitrary service uh, you're going to have a key and that key is not going to be any different. How you use it will be different, but at the end of the day, it's just a key. It's just a wallet that is storing uh, value of assets um, or issuing assets as we might, as the case may be, as, as we'll see. But there are no, there's no uh, hierarchy of account types. How you use them will determine what kind of key it is, but there are no different kinds of keys. Um, you, so you may hear words like issuing account or uh, uh, distributor account or user account, but at the end of the day within Stellar, we don't care. The, the database is going to see all things as the same. It's just how your application uses those things. So you don't have to search the documentation for how do I create an issuing account. If you have a key, it can be an issuing account. And that, that's quite different than a lot of uh, blockchains out there where there may be different types of, of keys or different types of accounts or the way your intention of how you use something will determine what you use. But here, everything starts as an account. It's just how you implement that that will determine what it is. And when we get to wallets then, uh, I have a whole talk on, on wallets. Wallets are very important to me, but it's because they're misused so, so often and uh, a bit of a misunderstanding around what a wallet is um, and its implementation in the ecosystem. Um, a wallet is simply something that allows you to store and use keys. So with keys being the asymmetric cryptography where you've got a public and a private key and the private key is how you sign transactions and the public key is what you pass around for people to make payments to you or to um, accept tokens that you may be issuing from that public key. Um, a wallet is that thing which stores it. So the wallet is the thing that you're either interacting with from a third party, party wallet or something that you're creating, but a wallet isn't necessarily an interface. Uh, with graphs and charts, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a Coinbase interface or a trading interface. You don't have to, and you really shouldn't default to showcasing everything that you might think a wallet is. A wallet is simply something that stores a key and allows you to sign transactions. So if you have a ledger or a treasure, um, even like a Tangem wallet, like it's just a wallet. All it does is store keys and allows you to use them. And so in that sense, if you're building an application, you are going to interact with a wallet. Either you're going to have one yourself or you're going to implement, integrate with a third party wallet. But this is where we start to get into a lot of issue with usability, where we force our users to use wallets, which are really just trading interfaces like mini Robin Hoods. Don't do that to your users if that's not what they want, if that's not what they expect. If you're saying, hey, you wanna play my game, 
but you have to go to this Robin Hood like interface that's going to be incredibly confusing and disorienting and ultimately you'll lose a lot of conversion and only appeal to um, crypto nerds. And if this thing is going to reach mass adoption, if we're really going to change and improve people's lives, we have to get away from a concept of this is only for finance and everybody needs to be interested in what's going on. You can obfuscate and should obfuscate away a whole lot of the confusion and functionality that is available, but isn't necessarily ideal or desirable for a lot of your users. So don't default to thinking that I can, I can or should just use all the other wallets that are already out there. If it's true, and it is, that wallets just store and allow the usage of keys, many times you can do this on your own, or you can uh, utilize wallets that people are already using and already familiar with, which, which may not at all uh, interact with trading or graphs and charts and other things. So it becomes very important that you, you think about that. That's, uh, that's such an important point. There have been way too many. I mean, it's just, it's such a barrier for a lot of folks that I've introduced this technology to. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you guys are pushing for that. Yeah. Yeah. We are going to pitch our podcast. Colton and I do a podcast uh, every week interviewing different folks. And this is a major theme for us um, when it comes to usability. Uh, we're not just trying to do cool things. We're trying to change people's lives and improve people's lives. Stellar is aiming to be the global payment standard. And if we're going to do that, we have to get away from just cryptography nerds. I think there's a lot, there's a tremendous amount of benefit in cryptography, but a lot of it needs to be obfuscated away um, as technologies which we utilize as developers, but don't necessarily surface all the way up to the user where they have 20 forward passphrases that they're keeping track of and will lose all of their money if they, that's just so weird and foreign and not a better experience than what we have right now, at least not as a default. So I'm not saying never do it, but be really careful considering that to be a default, you will shoot yourself in the foot as far as getting adoption into your platform if you never really truly consider, is this something that is better for my users than what they're already using? Because ultimately this thing dies if it's not better. <clears throat> uh, but eventually, yeah, we, we get from keys to wallets to payments. Uh, payments is the bread and butter of what these the Stellar uh, blockchain exists to facilitate um, the movement of. Like we're trying to make payments, whether that's actual fiat currency is really just value transfer. I have something that you want and we want to get it to each other without having to worry about trusting each other. So the execution of payments. And there's all kinds of beautiful, wonderful things you can do within Stellar around these payments. That's where the different operations within a transaction will come into play. Um, but understanding that this ultimately is what we're trying to accomplish is the movement of something from one party to another. Um, so relatively basic and simple. We can go into more depth, but uh, keys, wallets, payments. All right. So as we build Stellar applications, uh, there are lots of different links and things I could share, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to narrow it down to, to four. Uh, we have a boilerplate, which is what we're going to spend most of our time in today, looking at some actual JavaScript code. Uh, there's also the JavaScript Stellar SDK, which is um, the, the repository for all of the functions and uh, classes and methods that you can call um, within Stellar. There's a Stellar laboratory, which is essentially a code playground where you can experiment with and very quickly construct actual real Stellar transactions and submit and view them on the network. Um, so that's going to be in, uh, make sure you bookmark that one. That one's gonna be popping up in your browser uh, uh, a ton, as well as Stellar Expert, which is a blockchain explorer, which allows you to see all of the accounts and transactions and operations and essentially just get a very uh, fine-grained and high-level, in-depth, whatever kind of look you want to get at the data within the Stellar blockchain, Stellar Experts, where you're going to want to go. Uh, there's another one that I want to pop up before we get into this too much. I think I've got a couple more slides that just go through each one of these. We're going to skip those, pretend like I did a great job on these slides. Um, <laughs> and we're going to pop over to stellar.org. You guys can still see my screen, right? I have an issue with this. Yeah, screen. we can. Yeah. All right, super. I think this is it. Yeah, so this, uh, this little graphic right here. Um, we, so these are all the things you're building, right? Asset issuers, wallets, payment providers, your application. And then we have this Stellar blockchain over on the other side, which is you know where we do the, the consensus and where we arrive at agreement 
around what the state of the ledger is. This is the, you know, every, every blockchain has their own version of handling this piece of it. Um, but then we have this thing in the middle here called Horizon, which is our API endpoint, which allows applications to interact with and submit modifications, mutations to Stellar Core. Uh, so this would be like the API, right? So this is the sanitized version. If you wanna get JSON data from Stellar Core out, you're gonna be using Horizon. At the end of the day, like uh, Stellar Core is just a Postgres database and a really complex uh, C++ program that runs all of this. But I'm a JavaScript developer. I don't wanna interact with a C++ program. I wanna interact with a REST API. So that's why Horizon exists. Uh, we interact with Horizon from our applications. And Horizon is not like uh, similar to um, Stellar Core where there's lots of different nodes which run an instance of Stellar Core and that's what creates um, the consensus around what the state of the ledger is. There's lots of different horizons running. SDF runs one and you may interact with SDF's um, horizon API endpoint, but you can also stand up your own. You can use uh, other uh, enterprises that uh, have stood up their own public horizon endpoints. You can use those as well. There's nothing special about a horizon endpoint. It's simply a public facing um, API interface is sanitized API interface for interacting with any particular Stellar Core node that the Horizon API endpoint is connected to. So this can trip up people. I know it tripped me up early on is what's the difference between Horizon and Stellar Core and which one do I actually need to run? The answer is they are different. Uh, I've described how Horizon is the REST API sanitized version. It, it basically takes all the jumbleness that is Stellar Core and turns it into something usable. Um, but you don't have to run either of these. You can just use an API endpoint that somebody else has stood up. You can, of course, and if you're running a production level service, you should probably stand up your own version of both of these things, um, particularly the Horizon endpoint. These things have rate limits, and since a lot of people are using our version of Horizon, you may want to use your own, but you don't have to. To get started, you can immediately see our API endpoint and start making requests to it. There's nothing you have to run to begin to interact with and submit transactions to or read transactions from uh, the Stellar network, which is fantastic. It allows you to get up and running very, very quickly. All right, I'm going to close that and open up. So this is, if you were to go to uh, GitHub Stellar Hack Stellar, this is the um, kind of boilerplate that we're going to be working from today, just getting started on the Stellar JavaScript uh, SDK showcasing how quickly you can get started building Stellar applications. So I'm going to, I'm going to make a very risky play and actually try and start this up in my, uh, my dev environment. Oh boy. I have confidence, right? I'm a, I'm a <laughs> full stack engineer. This should just work. Yeah. <laughs> Same if we go to localhost, Three, 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 three. That should pop up. So this is kind of what we're building here. Uh, it's already built, but I will walk through what these things are and the methods around them. So this is a. If you guys are familiar with um, Svelte or um, Stencil JS, it's essentially a component library building um, web components. Uh, I really, really like web components. It allows you to build demos very easily, but then also reuse demo components all over the web. It's phenomenal if you're doing like explainers, examples, you can just import a, a web component straight into the documentation and people can interact with it rather than having to use screenshots. So it's a phenomenal little tool, um, both for production level web application development as well as just doing examples. So that's what I'm using. I'm using Stencil.js. Um, from my good friends at Ionic. And so we'll be building uh, a Stencil.js web app. So if we just jump right, let's jump into our package. It's always a good place to start, right? Um, we've got some scripts to run different things. I'm just using the start to do a dev environment. We've got some different dependencies here, which um, set up our environment to use uh, both the Stencil things as well as right here at the bottom, the Stellar SDK. Uh, inside of our source, everything magical and wonderful will be happening inside our source and most everything other than some CSS 
uh, will be happening inside of app home app root just sets up the root of our application if we were to have like different routes um, or other pages and functionality you might use or modify your app root but most of my work today all of my work really will be inside of app home so this is using uh, TypeScript and we're also using a TSX file so that we can generate uh, HTML within our render function. So if you've done any React work, you should be more or less at home. If you've done any Angular work inside of the newer Ionics, this should, this should feel somewhat familiar, um, but particularly if you've done TypeScript work. And even if you haven't done a lot of TypeScript work, uh, it's relatively easy to follow. Um, TypeScript, uh, I, was a, I was an old school jQuery, didn't even know what a JavaScript class was. And then I was jumped, like dropped straight into object oriented JavaScript programming at the same time ES6 came out right about the same time my employers wanted me to start using uh, TypeScript. So I had to learn all of this relatively quickly and it was wonderful. It was fantastic. So if you haven't had the opportunity to start learning some more modern JavaScript programming, particularly in the TypeScript arena, um, I would highly suggest uh, getting some courses um, and starting to dive into it a bit more. It'll, it'll allow you to write, write much better, uh, more production ready and easy to test uh, JavaScript. No comments, Colton. Uh, all right, so we're gonna be spending our time, like I said, in App Home to create this interface here. Um, up at the top, we're just kind of getting set up with all of our imports, um, which allows to uh, perform different functionality underneath. And then the, the big one's going to be this import of the Stellar SDK, importing a couple of different um, methods or classes that are available to us in the Stellar SDK. Uh, the big one here, so I talked about Horizon. This is where you're going to, when you create this new server, essentially when you say, hey, I would like to connect to Stellar. I would like to begin looking things up and submitting transactions. Um, whenever you do that, you're going to need to interact with a server. And that server is going to take an argument, which is your um, Horizon API endpoint. So this one is the one that's run by the Stellar organization. So if we were to go to our laboratory, we can see that URL right here. So the laboratory is using that same URL that I'll be using in the examples. If you were to go to the public network, you'll see the same thing um, right there, but we're using the test net, so we'll keep it on that one. So we'll just copy that and uh, that'll be the thing that we paste in here. If you're running your own Horizon, that'll be what you'll put uh, for that, now we have this uh, server class, which we can use um, anywhere else inside of this um, app home class. There's a couple of states that we're setting up inside of Stencil.js if you set up a state, and this is kind of a TypeScript thing too. Um, if you set up a state, this is something that is uh, watched. So if I update key pair, if there's something inside of the DOM that is using key pair, it will automatically re-render um, uh, the DOM based off of that key pair update. If I were to use a prop, um, that would not be the case. So a prop would just be a property um, that is not dynamically updating a DOM. And there may be cases where you would want to use that. Uh, for my case, I most typically use states because those things will be updating, particularly in the cases of like errors and loading screens or um, my DOM changes a whole lot based on the state of whether or not you've generated a key pair or funded your account. I mean, depending on what you've done or what operations you've performed, uh, the DOM will need to change. And so the state will dictate um, what that uh, DOM should look like. So making sure you have the difference between the states and the props. Um, so you set up a couple of different states. Uh, component will load. This is an important one. Just just a method for Sensel that runs uh, as soon as the DOM has loaded that component or is going to load that component. So you can run some different logic in here. In this case, we're not. Um, but this is where you would load up um, any dynamic data if you need to call like another API, which you want to call before the actual view generates. That's where you'll call um, these types of things. This can be an asynchronous function, um, which allows you to wait and say, hey, don't load the page until you've called this API endpoint and can preload any state so that uh, you don't have this weird like jumping screen between like logged in versus not logged in, for example. All right, and then we have all of our methods which will uh, very much closely correlate if I uh, roll these up really quick. 
these are all going to correlate directly with our buttons. So generate, fund, update, create uh, this friend account, and send a payment. So we'll start with our generate key pair. Uh, this one's incredibly simple. All it does is take the key pair method from uh, this Stellar SDK and generates a random key pair. So this is going to be the public and private combination, the public private key put together into a key pair, which will allow you to um, share the public key or use it to look up information about that key, as well as have the secret key, which you can use to sign transactions for that account. So generate key pair, if we look down here at our DOM, our HTML, you can see we have a button. When it's clicked, there's generate key pair, it will fire off that generate key pair. It's gonna clear any errors, accounts, anything else is basically gonna reset the whole UI and then generate a brand new key pair. So we'll click that right now. And we'll notice that immediately the DOM changes and that's because it's a state that loads up this key pair which is this state right here. And so there's probably somewhere in here, a Boolean or um, if statement that's going to check for, if there's a key pair, do this, if there's not, do nothing. And that's what this block right here is that basically says, if there's a key pair, uh, show those keys. Otherwise, don't show anything underneath this button. And so once we click generate key pair, it loads in the key pair to that, um, to that uh, state and then we'll generate this DOM element on top of that. And so that's what we have right here. There's also two more buttons right there. One of them is the copy. So we imported this little copy um, NPM package, which essentially takes whatever your input is and puts it into your clipboard. So we can copy our public key. So I'm gonna click copy that. And you can see we have our public key. And if I copy the secret key, same thing, we get the secret key. So that's just a nice little helper so that we could import our uh, public key. So as I mentioned, this is running on directly on the blockchain. We generate our key pair. We go to our endpoint explorer here. We look up our single account. We are gonna get a beautiful 404 because that account has been generated, but it doesn't exist on the blockchain because we are not covering the base fee. So this account is valid in the sense that the string, the key pair itself is valid, but it hasn't been used on the blockchain yet. And so the resource is missing. To be able to actually see this resource, to be able to actually uh, visualize and see this account on the blockchain, we're going to need to fund it in some way. And because it's on the test net, um, we're able to use a very handy little um, function or a handy little helper, which is FriendBot. Uh, and FriendBot is just an API endpoint that basically says, hey, take this public account and give it 10,000 lumens. Obviously, this only works on the test net. Do not try this on the public net. It will fail. You cannot get 10,000 free lumens. You heard it here first. But on the friend bot, you can. So this is a great way to kind of kickstart your development. Um, allows you to fund accounts relatively quickly. It'll basically just take the public key. So we have this key pair, the public key for that key pair. Call the friend bot and say, hey, take this key pair and give it 10,000 lumens. If that happens, then we're going to trigger up that update account, which is a button here, but it's really just a method, which we'll get to in a second. But let's go ahead and fund that. So we're gonna click that. It's gonna shoot off to FriendBot, send us 10,000 lumens. So now when we call submit on this, and you'll notice that even though our interface is over here on our local environment, we are interacting with the real test net because we've just recalled this same public key that we just a minute ago, that was a 404 and now it exists on the test net. And sure enough, it has 10,000 of our native XLM asset. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, our public key here, whoops, our public key here, JMJ, JMJ, same public key. Beautiful, fantastic. It might be worth uh, touching on Tyler, how you would do that on the main net really quickly. You can't do it on the main net. It's impossible to create accounts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so the way you're going to fund public uh, accounts on the mainnet is exactly the same way that the friend bot does it. You just can't use the friend bot. You kind of have to act as a friend bot on your own. You're going to need to have some other account already available with Lumens to send to an account. So let's say, for example, we take this account. Now this account is funded. So you may fund an account by going to uh, Coinbase or Kraken or Polyneix or something and getting some Lumens on an exchange which then you have the lumen, so you can use that to build a create account, 
transaction. So let's just go ahead and do that here on the laboratory. So I'm making sure I'm on testnet. I'm gonna pull in this account, which has 10,000 lumens. Grab that sequence number, um, which basically says this is the next operation or the next transaction that this account is allowed to submit. And we're going to select the operation for uh, create account. Now to create an account, we're gonna need a destination address. So we're gonna go and just generate. So in the same way that we generated a key pair here, we're gonna do the same thing on the laboratory. So this account right now does not exist, right? So it's just, we just generated, it's not live yet. We're gonna actually need to fund it. But rather than using TestBot, we're gonna use the account that we just created on our Hack Stellar interface. We'll give that 100 lumens because I'm not quite as generous as FriendBot. Now we need to sign that transaction. How do we sign it? With our private key. So we'll copy that private key, sign this transaction to pay that account or to create that account with 100 lumens submit that to the network. And assuming that this all goes well, which it never doesn't, um, we'll, uh, we'll see that that account is, is now created. So if we were to look up that account that we just created back on our endpoint uh, explorer, we should see that we have an account that's been created and it should have 100 lumens. So on the public net, that's how you would handle that. That's a great clarification point because you can't use the FriendBot on testnet, but it is worth noting that the FriendBot does this. It just does it in a service rather than um, you having to do it manually. Um, I have found it, honestly, once you get to a point where you're beyond a hack stage to actually implement this logic yourself so that you can just flip a switch and you're ready to go to prod, uh, the production network. But if you have FriendBot sitting around and you switch to the prod network, you're gonna have issues. So once you're kind of past the hack stage, you need to build in logic that says, who's gonna fund new accounts? How are we gonna create new accounts? Because we can't use FriendBot, so what are we gonna do? But when you're just hacking, getting started, FriendBot's a good way to kind of just get at least one account funded with 10,000 without having to go through an exchange or something. Okay, so we've gotten through our account funding. Let's look at the um, update account method. And I'm gonna take a quick drink of water. I promise that was water. Uh, <laughs> it's so, Friday. Uh, yeah, it's Friday. Uh, account, <laughs> Yikers. Uh, account updates. So this is uh, going to call the server, right? So this is going to pull in the horizon endpoint that we loaded back up at the top. And it's going to call a method load account. And load account takes a public key. It says, just like we did on our Stellar Laboratory for calling this account, this get endpoint. <clears throat> Uh, it calls that account and then it's a promise. So we're gonna say once you've loaded that account, then show that account and we're gonna log the account, um, JSON uh, results. I'm deleting the links, which is just like this extra data uh, right here, this object right here, because it just includes a lot of information for like other endpoints you can call, which is not something that I wanted to display in my, excuse me, in my view right here. So I delete those, that uh, particular key, and then I load this account object to the this account, which again is coming from our state. And so when that state updates, there's probably another Boolean somewhere in here that says, if there's an account, show that account as, um, as uh, an actual block. So if we were to look up uh, this account, in our interface. Um, we should see right here that it checks it. Uh, and then right here, it actually loads this pre block, which is our code block, which says if there's an account, stringify the account and give us a nice little listing of um, the account data. So that's, uh, that's nice. And we'll also notice here, interestingly enough, that we have 10,000 lumens, but didn't we just make a payment from this account to create another account. Well, yes, we did, but we need to update our account. But when we update that account, we should see our balance drop to 9,000. So we'll click update and it drops to, oh, 9,900 because we only gave them 100 lumens because I'm not that generous. You also notice that there's a little bit more than that taken away and that is because of the transaction fee that is paid per operation. So if you go back to our build transaction, we put in a base fee, which is the, the base fee per operation, which says I'm willing to pay uh, this many stroops per operation. Stroops is a billionth, a 10 billionth of a lumen, something like that. The very, very the smallest, uh, 
the smallest um, fraction of a lumen. So when we go to sign transaction, it'll show us what the transaction fee is, those 100 stroops, and that's the 100 stroops that's been taken away from uh, this balance here, which is why it's the missing, missing uh, that fee, because that was paid when we submitted this transaction along with the 100 lumens that we paid to create that other account. So anyway, that's our update function. You also notice when we click buttons, this is kind of just an aside, it shows that little loading icon and that's because all of these methods up at the top set. So if we go to the update account, we'll notice that loading is setting to update of true. And so there's another Boolean that says, if the, if the loading state of this button um, uh, right here, if the loading state is true, we're going to set the button to be disabled, which means, uh, and along with the disabled state of uh, update account, there's a CSS attribute that says, uh, remove the actual text and just put dot, dot, dot in there to show a nice little uh, loading icon. All right, so that is update account. And update account is actually called quite often. We wanna update the account anytime uh, fees are removed, anytime we make payments, anytime something is uh, changing on that account. So you'll notice that update account is called a few times in other places, like when we funded the account. And we'll notice it also when we create the friend account, often at the end after something has happened. So that's kind of the next thing you wanna do. So we have our account, that's great, but I wanna do more than that. I want to make a payment. But before I can make a payment, I need uh, a friend account. So that's actually what we're gonna do Next, I'm gonna wrap up these ones just to make it a little bit uh, cleaner. The next one is account create. So what we did in the Stella laboratory, when we're not using FriendBot, um, we're actually going to make the same uh, operation here of create account on our uh, friend account. So like we did when we actually did the generate uh, key pair, we're just gonna generate a new key pair for our friend. And then we're going to load our account so that we can load up a new transaction builder. So this is the code that's coming from uh, the Stellar SDK, which is going to build a valid transaction for us to submit to the network over that Horizon server endpoint that we have. So we load the account and then we're gonna build a transaction. That transaction is gonna have the base fee. So just like we did um, here, we're gonna set the base fee. The sequence number comes from when we uh, load the account so this account will have the sequence number in it. We load the base fee. We set our network passphrase, which is coming from, again, the uh, uh, Horizon endpoint that we're using. So if this Horizon endpoint is the testnet, we can just set it to our network's te testnet passphrase. And then we're going to begin adding operations. And there's lots of different operations that you can add. Um, if we were to go back to just really quick, I think this is important to um, see, that was the wrong one. Uh, go to the documentation for this right here. If we go to our operations, uh, Looks like it might be in base right now. I'm not sure where operate, there it is, operation. Um, we have lots of different operations available to us. So create accounts, the one that we're using right now, but there's many, many, many others that allow you to do different things, allow you to modify accounts or uh, account data in different ways. Uh, in the laboratory, that would be all of our drop down items right here. And you can chain lots of different operations together. And this is something that's very powerful within Stellar that um, took me a while to realize is that each transaction can have up to, I think a hundred right now, different operations. So you don't have to just create an account on a transaction. You can create an account and then make a payment and then make trades, then delete the account or have that account make other, you can add and chain together a whole lot of different operations in a single transaction. And they're all atomic, which means they're all going to succeed or they're all going to fail together. And this is a, this is tremendous. This is actually phenomenal 
when you come to business logic, because this is something we face all the time, particularly like dealing with uh, the Stripe API. If you do something, uh, you can perform just that one operation and then you have to perform the next and then the next and the next. So if one of them is uh, charge my client and then give my client the file or give my client uh, the download and that fails, then you should probably roll back the payment from above. But that's hard to do because now you've got tricky logic tied in between um, making payments and other operations and they have to kind of like roll that back. Um, but within Stellar, it's all atomic where each piece happens or none of it happens. And so the whole thing succeeds or the whole thing fails. So uh, you're able to ensure uh, by using complex logic and not bundling individual operations into single transactions, but bundling as much logic as you can into a single transaction, you can accomplish a whole lot of very complex logic without having to worry about, Ooh, I hope nothing goes wrong because then I have to worry about how to undo all the things that succeeded. Instead of having to do that, just put as much as you can into an atomic transaction so that it either all succeeds or all fails together. That's awesome. Does that have any effect on how expensive it is to run a transaction on the network? Each operation, it doesn't, it actually has no effect as far as let's say you have a hundred operations and you run them in a hundred transaction, that's going to cost the same as if you ran all of the operation because each, uh, each fee comes on a per operation, not on a per transaction. So if I added more operations um, to this, like if you remember before it was one, it was a hundred stroops for this one operation. If we look at the transaction now, it's going to be 200 because there are two operations. And so if you had 100, it would be that 100 times 100 for whatever the current fee uh, is. Makes sense. Um, so this is a tremendously powerful um, functionality within Stellar that is definitely underutilized. And as people implement it more, instead of doing single operations on transactions. This also allows you to bundle lots of different operations and transactions to get around some of the rate limiting issues where if you're trying to push hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of transactions to the network, each with only singular operations, maybe you could think about bundling and saying, let's collect a hundred operations, put that into a single transaction. And now instead of sending a hundred transactions, you just sent one with a hundred operations. So I've used that. That's when I really started getting into whoa, you can do a whole lot more in a single transaction than I thought was when I was trying to do a whole lot of stuff very, very quickly. Um, you can, you can uh, accomplish that. You can accomplish a uh, hundred times more when you bundle uh, operations into a transaction rather than thinking of transactions and operations as the same thing, which they are not. All right, so we're adding, in this case, however, with that caveat said, I'm only using one operation in this particular transaction, which is just creating the account for the friend uh, that we're gonna generate and we're gonna give him a starting balance of 10 lumens, which is going to come from the account that I loaded. So the source account, and this is another really important aspect when creating transactions. The source account that you put right here is going to be the default source for operations, but it doesn't have to be the source for the operations. So in this case, when I, say I would like to pay, or I would like to create this account with a balance of 100 lumens. Where are those 100 lumens coming from? Who's paying those 100 lumens to this account? They're not just coming from Stellar, they're coming from somebody's account. We can't just generate you know, money out of thin air. It has to come from somebody. Well, it's coming from the source account that we set up above, unless we set a different source account down at the bottom. If we wanted somebody else to pay for, um, this 100 lumens, we could absolutely do that. We would just have to sign for it, right? I can't just take your account and say, hey, I'm gonna make uh, Colton pay for this guy's account. The only way that that would work is if Colton signed off on it. So as operations are added to a transaction, the permissions for those operations are also required at the signature stage. But this is a really powerful thing. Again, if you wanted to create, um, let's say 100 accounts or make payments from 100 accounts, you can absolutely do that. You just have to be aware that we're going to need to collect those signatures for those operations as well. Signatures are not from this part of the transaction. They're from the operation part of the transaction, uh, which is again, very important and allows you to do a whole lot of crazy things um, when you start to see transactions as just packages of operations. It's like a UPS truck filled with packages that are operations, but not all of those packages are your packages. 
just because it's a UPS truck that came to your house doesn't mean every, okay, I'm getting a little too far in that analogy. It's uh, time to move on. Um, so we load the account, create the transaction. We're just going to create accounts. So let's go ahead and click that button. Enough explanation. We, we create the account. Let's look at our um, network though, right? Because these, these actually just send REST API. I've talked a lot about Horizon being a REST API endpoint. So we're going to create the account. And there it is. Our transaction goes out uh, right here to the transactions post endpoint. So we're saying I would like to post a transaction to this Horizon API endpoint with this transaction envelope. And if we were to inspect this, uh, if we were to inspect this transaction envelope inside of the laboratory, we're going to see the instructions that we just created um, for it, right? So uh, there's the account that we created, the JMJ. It has a fee of 100 because there's one operation, the next sequence number for it. And it has this one operation, which is uh, the create account operation. And it's creating a brand new uh, friend account with that 10 lumens. And it has a signature, which is our, um, our signature from the secret key right here. So if we were to inspect this, we create, we build the transaction, and then we sign it with our key pair. And then we submit that transaction to the network, which is what we did right here. We got a 200 back. The transaction successfully made it to the network. And then I believe in the response, we get back a hash. So we can look at that hash on the laboratory. So if we go to Endpoint Explorers and we look up the transaction that we just submitted, we send it that hash and we can see this transaction uh, on uh, the network, as well as the envelope XDR, which is, this is the actual transaction we just looked at with that operation, as well as all the other results, the metadata, the fee, there's lots of information that comes back when a transaction makes it to the network. But you can also see how quickly that went through. Um, just a couple of seconds, but it actually went to the network. It verified across all of the nodes and um, was published to the network in a way that we can see it on a completely different computer, different, completely different machine as verified as having gone through. Uh, and then we, the next call was simply loading back up that account, updating this account because we've made that $10 uh, payment, we can see we're starting to lose more of our, this, that 100 stroops. We've made two operations, so that's decreased from uh, our clean balance of 10,000 down to uh, those 200 stroops now, which have been paid out in fees. So the last thing we have to do here is to send our friend a payment, which is going to look exactly the same as what we did up here, except our operation in this case is going to be a payment. And we could have very easily just done this and that would work just fine. We had two operations where so long as that account exists, we just make another operation, which is paying that friend um, uh, those, uh, or this, in this case now it's gonna be a hundred lumens. So we would create the account with 10 and then add for, uh, make a payment for a hundred, but uh, we're gonna separate those two things out in this case and just add a single payment. And so we'll send that. We'll notice another transaction goes out here uh, posting that transaction, sending that payment to our friend for uh, the 100 lumens that goes through. And we can see the results again. If we were to look up that hash, we're going to get a very similar output. If we look up the envelope XDR, we can see that there was a payment operation for 100 lumens paid to our friend. We go back, our balance is decreasing. We can actually look up, if we go to laboratory, look at that friend, that USB. Um, friend that we made a payment to, we can make that, that um, look up their account on the network and see that they do in fact now should have 110. So 10 from when we created the account and then 100 from when we paid them. Let's actually look those guys up on Stellar Expert really quick. So this is that network blockchain explorer that I was talking about. We'll go to the test net and look up this friend account. And there, there it is, exists on the chain has two operations. One is the creating account for 10 lumens and the other one is paying the 100 lumens from our original account. So just like that, we didn't have to spin up any blockchains. We didn't have to do anything. And we're making live payments that exist all over the globe. Anyone could see this. Isn't that magical uh, by Super. the power of Stellar? Um, got a couple minutes left. If, if people would like to ask 
questions, comments, uh, you can ask Colton any crude remarks. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's how easy it is to get uh, set up and going with with Stellar. All right, everyone should be able to unmute in case you want to ask a question, or you can ask in chat. Uh, I guess while people are waiting to ask anything, I was gonna I added in the chat a note that a create account operation is not the same as a payment operation. This has come up a few times over the past couple of weeks. So just make sure that you're not trying to send payments to accounts that haven't first been created under the assumption that it will create the account because it won't. Yeah, that's a great point. And again, one of the reasons that if you do want to make a payment, you first need to check if the account exists. And if it doesn't, you might want to add an operation. So um, I'm not showing my screen right now, but if you are in that code where you pay somebody, you could include an if, an if statement, which first looks up the account. And if it doesn't exist, adds an operation before the payment, which creates the account, or maybe instead of the payment, creates the account for that balance. So if you're trying to pay someone 100, but their account doesn't exist, rather than making a payment of 100, make a create account operation with a destination amount of 100 lumens. So yeah, that's, that's generally what like exchanges do for, um, if you're withdrawing from an exchange to a brand new wallet or something like that, they generally do some sort of logic in that way and then do the create account as the payment. And the other thing I, I thought would be interesting to touch on is probably sequence numbers because sometimes that can be confusing. Um, I think if anybody here is familiar with building on Ethereum, a sequence number is pretty close to, um, I think it's called a transaction nonce on Ethereum, where things are ordered based on the number. So basically, uh, sequence numbers on Stellar's are attached to an account, and then um, that's used in order to prevent things like double spending. So yeah, if, if you didn't have sequence numbers, people could essentially take the same transaction and just submit it again and again and again and, and have the same output, which would just continuously spend or pay or whatever. But with a sequence number, you're basically saying, I would like to submit this again. The blockchain looks at that sequence number and says, okay, well, instead of that, how about we just show you what you did for that sequence number? We're not gonna run the same operation, but we will show you what you did when you submitted that sequence number, which is actually kind of cool because um, you, can, you can absolutely submit. So if I go to, um, this transaction that I submitted, is this the one that went through? Yeah, I can actually take this envelope. I can go to the Endpoint Explorer, transactions, post transaction. So that same operation that we were doing in the UI where I posted a transaction with the XDR, I can just keep submitting this, right? And it just keeps going through. Am I continuously making payments again and again and again? No, because the sequence number is consumed. And so what the account, what the transaction submission uh, Horizon API endpoint, when you do this, looks at the, at the sequence number and says, well, we already have a uh, uh, transaction for this sequence number for this account. So rather than failing, we're just going to show you the output. So essentially it is a replay, but it's not a replay attack. It's just saying, here's what you did. Here was the output when you used this sequence number in the past. Um, so it's, it's both a very positive thing for um, disabling replay attacks, but it's also a really powerful tool for uh, allowing somebody to send the same transaction and produce the same result that they did whenever it actually was submitted for the first time. Cool. <laughs> Anything else? Open floor for any questions before we break. I think you're just so good, Tyler, that there's no way anybody could ever ask a question. I would actually, yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. I'd be offended if somebody didn't <laughs> perfectly understand how Stellar works at this point. Does anyone, um, anyone quickly want to share what they're working on? If you're working on the Stellar Prizes? <laughs> cool. If it's quiet, if it's quiet too, we can, um, we can just hop off and the Stellar team, you guys have been in Gitcoin chat as well, right? Um, and available for questions and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I'm in, I've been hopping in the Times Square th or Town Square, Times Square, uh, Town Square <laughs> thing. 
Uh, and then we also uh, have our key base team that I will share on a post I made earlier in the town square so people can go in there into the hackathon channel or the dev discussion channel or whatever and ask any questions they have. Nice. Is that, is that uh, link also in the prize description too? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, it should be in the prize description. It's also in the get started repo we put together. So it's all over the place. Um, if you wanted to, you could easily find it. Awesome. So if anyone has follow up questions on that. Uh, I, we got the recording for this, so I'm excited to share this um, on the prize as well, and we'll we'll pop this into Town Square so folks can take a look if they're looking to get started. Uh, but really appreciate you guys uh, joining and uh, sharing a much more in-depth kind of look at this stuff. I hope this is really helpful for folks. Yeah, you bet. Thanks so much for hosting. It was a lot of fun. Yep, yep. Cool. All right. I'll see you all later. All right, all right. everybody. See you guys. Bye.